Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Karstensen, Editor-in-Chief of Dental Sleep Practice Magazine, a Medmark publication. Welcome to a live presentation and Q&A with Dr. John Julian. In our web webinar today, we will be illustrating both clinical applications and clinical use of CBCT in dentistry. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions. Your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today, Dr. John M. Julian. Dr. Julian received his Doctor of Dental Science degree from the University of Missouri at Kansas City Dental School in 1978 after doing his undergraduate work at the University of Kansas, whose Jayhawks just lost to the University of Washington basketball team a few days ago. <laughs> he lived and practiced dentistry in McPherson, Kansas from 1978 to 2011 when he relocated to South Carolina to open his new practice the dental retreat at Mountain Park in December of 2011. This facility not only houses his growing dental practice, but it's also where Dr. Julian holds a majority of his very popular over-the-shoulder hands-on implant courses. He maintains an active membership in the American Dental Association, Academy of General Dentistry, South Carolina Dental Association, Academy of Laser Dentistry, International College of Oral Implantologists, and Doctors for Oral Conscious Sedation. He lectures extensively throughout the United States and Europe on dental implants and the use of lasers and new technology in dentistry. He's a visionary in the implementation of technology into the general dental practice, such as digital scanning, comb beam technology, and platelet-rich fibrin procedures. Please welcome Dr. Julian. Well, I think thank you very much, except for that comment about the, by Kansas Jayhawks. Okay, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about comb beam technology um, as we try to use it in the dental practice. So what I'd like you to imagine is a patient walks in and the patient says, Doc, I've got this broken tooth. I want you to put a filling in it. But the filling is cracked. The tooth is cracked. And you as a dentist probably want to try to get the patient to see the value of doing a crown. Well, how do you get him to see that? If you take a photograph and he can visualize the fracture, the size of the broken piece, and you try to point out the lack of strength in a filling, you probably have a pretty good chance of getting him to do what you want him to do because he can visually understand what your words mean. To make that work, you're going to first of all have to overcome some objections. For example, well, what does it cost? Is it going to hurt? Well, how long is this going to last? What, what do I value as a person and as a patient is going to determine what I do with that restoration. So cost is always the first issue. It's the first question you get. And what I would advise for doctors who take my courses is I would say put that issue aside for just a minute. When somebody asks me what does something cost, I always say, well, I don't know right up front, but let me put a little time and study into it and we'll get the cost to you before we do anything. And that says I'm not going to ignore it, but I am going to put it aside for a minute while we talk about what's the value of this crown. Why is it have, does it have better longevity? Why does it have better value for you? And why will it keep you out of my chair more, which is really what you want to do. Now, the reason I bring up this analogy is because we need to do a consultation with patients to give them value. If we create value for the treatment that we're proposing and they understand the reasoning and the rationale and they can visually see what's going on with their tooth, then we can address all of their objections, point out the benefits of the recommended therapy. When we get done, now we bring in the issue of cost. To get that thing that you want, here's what it will cost. Once you see the value, the dollar signs will not get in the way. If you tell somebody what something costs, then they tend to focus only on the money or only on the dollar signs, and they don't hear anything else you say beyond that. So I always try to put that issue off. Now, why do I tell you this? A lot of you out there in the audience do not own a comb beam. 
So one of the things I've asked myself is, well, what are the objections to owning a comb beam? Why doesn't every dentist out there own one? And you'd be amazed to find out that the first question that most doctors ask is, what does it cost? There's a, a group of doctors out there that are concerned about radiation exposure. That's another objection. There's a group that say, well, I can only use it for implants. Um, I recently was at a course <clears throat> last weekend where the issue of if I take a cone beam, the insurance doesn't cover it, they really want full mouth series or a panorex, something they're more used to seeing. And finally, well, what can I do with a cone beam? I mean, they don't, the doctor doesn't appreciate what they can do in the way of patient education. So I'm going to take the issue of cost and I'm going to put it aside. I'm not going to answer that question right off the bat. We'll get to it by the end of the, of the program. Let's take the issue of radiation exposure. A lot of doctors think that the exposure from a cone beam is excessive or too much or maybe in the dangerous level. And so what I try to get them to see is we can actually measure what the radiation exposure is. Once we get a finite number, <clears throat> we can then compare that to other things that happen every day. For example, when you get up out of bed, walk through the day, you're exposed to six to eight microsieverts if you don't go to the beach, if you don't go out and play, play golf. So six to eight microsieverts is everyday exposure for every human being on the planet. If I took a film-based radiograph, that radiograph is going to give me more microsieverts, 30 to 40. If I took a digital PA, that's back to 8. There, there it is. I've just doubled my daily exposure. If you fly across country, you expose yourself to 40 microsieverts. I just took a trip to India and back, so I would say I got exposed to a couple hundred microsieverts. And if I went to the doctor and they, he said you need a CT scan for some medical condition, I'm going to get exposed from anywhere from 1,200 to 3,000 microsieverts. Now, let's compare a digital PA at 8 to 1,200 to 3,000. It's quite a difference. So <clears throat> a lot of doctors say, well, let's take full mouth series as opposed to taking um, a comb beam because it's probably safer and we're going to get exposed to fewer. So here's my question for you guys. There are 17 to 20 films in a full mouth series. But that's not really true because we rarely take the exact number of films. We usually have some retakes in there. So I'm going to pick a number, a reasonable number of 20. And I'm going to say, okay, if we're exposed to eight microsieverts per digital film, and we're going to take 20 every time we do a full mouth series, that's 160 microsieverts. And that's very easy to figure. If I looked at the cone beam exposure, uh, the company I, I work with is Prexion, and this, this particular manufacturer has a machine out called the Excelsior. I just had it installed in my office in February. An average adult scan is 78 microsieverts, less than half of what that full mouth series uh, consumed. I can do a child rapid scan for 25 microsieverts. Think of it, three PAs, and I can get a cone beam taken on a child, which means it's safer to take a cone beam on a child than to do four bite wings or a full mouth series on a child. I can do an extra oral bite wing, which takes now all of that material out of the mouth, and patients really like extra oral bite wings. Again, we're down to eight and a half microsieverts. Or I can create a panorex at 10.6 microsieverts. So the amount of radiation in today's units is so low, it's so efficient, that the idea of radiation being a concern should disappear. If you upgrade to new technology, the safety issues all go, they all become much better. Now, <clears throat> to read a cone beam, you have to read it in three planes, basically. 
and those planes are axial or top to bottom. You'll notice on the picture on the right you can see the pulp chambers. Coronal, front to back. So on the posterior teeth, I'm looking at a cross section. I can see, walk through the tooth, see the, the lingual surface and the buccal surface, and I'm walking mesial to distal. Or sagittal, side to side. In this case, on an anterior tooth, now I'm looking mesial to distal. So these are the views we look at when we're taking a comb beam. And then that plane you can see going through that gentleman's head, we can manipulate that plane not just side to side, but in any direction on any axis. So we basically have an infinity of selections of views of any given tooth. The next thing we want to understand is field of view. A small field of view, pictured on the left, is limited diagnostically, but it also has a smaller amount of radiation, and it typically is more, uh, more accurate and more detailed in its image. Now, who would want a small field of view? It would be somebody like an endodontist. They're working basically one tooth at a time. A medium field of view encompasses most dental procedures. That's the, the middle picture, and that would be most general dentists. A large field of view to the right would be for those in orthodontics and reconstructive surgery. So there's really no need for me as a general dentist to need a large field of view. And a large field of view drives the cost of the machines up, it increases the radiation exposure, and it's not quite as detailed as the smaller field of view. So the medium field of view will satisfy most of my needs. So <clears throat> what can we do as a general dentist? In my current practice, I don't have a lot of children, but every now and then I get a child in. Here's an eight-year-old that came into my office. We noted caries. We noted tooth position discrepancies. We noticed abscessed teeth. I was able to look at his epiglottis and his airway, all because I was able to take one picture that diagnostically showed me more than a full mouth series would have shown or any two-dimensional image. I could show the parents how teeth are developing in the jaws and what it means to lose a primary tooth early and how space can collapse. So this becomes very good for me to educate parents, then to get this child to the proper treatment if they're going to go and have orthodontics done. In this case, there's going to be some teeth removed and several things need to be accomplished. But education is always the first step. Here's another child. <clears throat> that was referred uh, from a pedodontist to an oral surgeon, but somehow they wound up in my office instead. And the reason they were going there was to have two uh, supernumerary teeth extracted. So we took a comb beam on the child. What's interesting is the picture on the left shows the supernumerary tooth or the mesiodens is actually apically positioned or, or the crown of the tooth pointed apically, whereas on the right, the tooth next to it is pointed 180 degrees different or coronally. Now knowing the position of those teeth, we're able to map out a strategy for surgically going in, removing those teeth, and not damaging uh, the permanent tooth or the surrounding structures. People ask me all the time, well can I see caries on a comb beam? If I don't have any restorations interfering, I can see caries more clearly on a comb beam than I can on a bite wing because I can eliminate a lot of the tooth structure, buccal and lingual, to where the actual caries is. So you can see the entry point in through the enamel and the size of the lesion very accurately. Here I've got a, a possible pulpal exposure and I'm talking to the patient about the possibility of endodontics versus a crown uh, versus extraction and they can see where the nerve chamber is and they can see where the caries are and the fact that there was a restoration there, there still is a restoration there, the caries was never completely removed from the restoration was done the first time. So it gives you an opportunity to talk to the patient and explain what possible complications you might run into or what procedures you should be prepared to do. And in this case, 
there's caries again, but note the radiolucin area in the furcation between the palatal root and the mesiobuccal root. This is very difficult to see two-dimensionally. It's hard to even probe this area. So if you have periodontal situation occurring and you have a large carious lesion and you're talking about a lot of expense to restore the tooth, perhaps a discussion should be had about doing periodontal therapy or possibly replacing the tooth. Uh, these are the kind of things that as a diagnostician you need to know before you start developing the treatment plan and presenting to the patient. Now if you do orthodontics, it's really handy to be able to see anything that's out of the ordinary. In this case, I've got a lower bicuspid, tipped distally, rotated 180 degrees, and obviously fully formed, so this patient must be, say, 12 to 14 years of age, and now this is going to be a real trick trying to get that into position. All right, so for just a minute, <clears throat> take a look at this two-dimensional panorex of an ongoing orthodontic case. This case was done many, uh, this is nine or ten years ago that I saw this patient. The panorex was sent by the orthodontist. And take a look for just a second and tell me what you see where the lower right lateral and lower right cuspid seem to be crossing each other. Because this is the image that a lot of us are doing our diagnostic work on. We're going to ignore the upper uh, canine that's impacted because I'm assuming that that's going to be treated at some point, but that's not our concern at this point. Right now, it's more the lower lateral and cuspid. When I saw the patient, clinically, I took a photo. And this is the mechanics that were being applied by the orthodontist. It looks like they're trying to uh, move the cuspid distally and pull the lateral mesially. It also looks or appears as if the cuspid has got a very thin bony covering. And in fact, it, it looks really tenuous. So not that the patient needed a cone beam, but I was curious as to what might transpire or what would be happening. And I thought, well, I'm just going to take a cone beam and not charge the patient, but just for my information. And this is the image that I found with that cone beam. The tooth is almost entirely out of the bone to the facial. And that orthodontist is going to have a difficult time getting it back into position, into the bone, especially when you consider that the lateral incisor is in the same position to the lingual. So I used to do orthodontics. I now appreciate the fact that the bone is very thin, very delicate. And when I started taking cone beams, I started cutting back on the amount of orthodontics I was doing. I now refer to an orthodontist in my current practice, but I never refer anyone to him without a cone beam. And he appreciates that very much. I think it's uh, a, the coming thing in orthodontics is to have cone beam technology for the diagnostic part of the case. In this case, an orthodontist actually referred a patient back to me to expose a couple of cuspids so he could put brackets on them. So we took the comb beam with the idea that we could see if it was palately or buccally positioned, which allowed us then to go in, identify the location of the tooth, and at that point expose and place a button on the tooth for the mechanics for the orthodontist. Uh, I use a CO2 laser which allows me to get in very cleanly. Well, there's no bleeding, there's no fluid. <laughs> it makes a good uh, environment for doing any kind of bonding procedure. Do the same thing on the other side. So, pedo and ortho. Now let's get to perio. Periodontics, or periodontal disease is very common in most practices. And I used to do numbers, and I, I still, I, we take measurements on everybody, but to be able to visualize the picture on the left, a furcation involvement between the mesobuccal and distobuccal roots of an upper second molar. Then you go to the picture on the right, and you can see the extent of the furcation where it runs into and meets the palatal root. Now, this is visualization that I never had before. So, I really appreciate knowing not just the measurement, but visually what that defect looks like. You can also see in that picture on the left, 
calculus on the first molar, calculus on the second bicuspid. If you look down below, you can see a bone loss on the lower second molar where the third molar is impacted and leaning mesially. And any time you're getting ready to, pro to provide treatment for a patient or prepare a treatment plan for the patient, having all of this information allows you to make recommendations that are more in benefit for the patient. If we're going to do implants, we would like to plan the implant placement. We would like to know the width of the bone, the height of the bone, the position of the inferior canal. So here's a, a typical case where we're getting ready to extract a tooth and I'm going to, to first of all go in and measure, because I'm not going to do an immediate placement here, I'm going, but I'm going to measure the buccolingual width, which is 11.9 millimeters. Then we're going to extract the tooth. Now I do some teaching on platelet-rich fibrin, so in this case, I elected to clean the tooth, the socket out, get all, rid of all the pathology, and instead of any kind of socket preservation graft, I, I did strictly platelet-rich fibrin placement. Sutured it into place, let the, the area heal for about three to four months. Five months later, the patient's ready to get his implant put back in, or his implant put in, and so we took another cone beam to reassess. So we go back in, we take another cone beam, and here you'll see adequate bone volume exists for the simple placement that we're about to accomplish. In fact, <clears throat> what I found interesting is if you go in the picture on the right and measure the width of the ridge buccolingually, you'll find that it went from 11.95 to 11.43. So in five months' time, without a socket preservation graft, we only lost a half a millimeter of bone width buccolingually. Now, if you go and look at the contour of the bone, it's fairly flat across, and we preserve the contours as well as the bone width. So I'm very excited about this because I can actually measure the results of my grafting procedures and determine which seems to work best in my hands. Now that I've measured the bone, let's go ahead and place the implant virtually. And if we place it virtually, what you'll find is you can do something and your muscle memory or your brain will record what you just did. Turn around and do it in the mouth, it becomes much easier. So virtual placement prior to actual surgery is a very big uh, benefit from the standpoint of the, the clinician. Now, if you look very closely at what that green virtual placement looks like, we'll do the same thing with our implant. Turn right around, place it in the exact position I, I imagine putting it in, and that minimizes your chair time, it minimizes the trauma to the patient. Uh, this was what we call a punch method implant. We simply created a hole in the tissue, did the osteotomy site, and placed the implant and the entire process takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes. So as we're doing this, you've got to understand that there's always two questions every dentist asks. And the first question is, well, what's the correct diagnosis? Why do I feel that this tooth suffers from a particular problem? Whatever this diagnosis is, is going to lead me to a treatment plan. Now the treatment plan must be something that satisfies the desires of the patient. Is he more price driven or is he value driven? Now, I just finished a very busy day. <clears throat> In fact, I was almost late getting on this, this webinar. But a patient came to me and he was from Nepal, barely spoke English. And I asked him, why he came to see me. He said, well, I went to one dentist, and the dentist told me that I needed to do something with this tooth. I needed a root canal. Then I went to another dentist, and they told me I needed a deep cleaning, and then I needed to get uh, number 18 and number 17 out. He said, I'm confused. And that is one of the problems in our profession, when two doctors disagree on the correct diagnosis. So I took a cone beam on this patient, I showed the patient the cone beam. I said, do you see that abscess? And I, I explained what it looks like on an x-ray, the dark area being the abscess, and he, it stood out, and he said, of course, I do. 
I said, do you also see this crack? And I could show him a fracture line in the middle of the tooth extending down into the furcation area. And he could. And then I could explain why a root canal was not an appropriate treatment plan for him because it would not save the tooth. He wanted to save the tooth, but I told him it couldn't be done. And he understood. I asked him if any of the other doctors had taken an x-ray like this, and he said no. And they're probably really conscientious people, but they are limited by their technology. So I really don't downgrade the other dentist. I try to say he did the very best he could with the technology he had. We just have something that we can see a little bit more. So this patient who doesn't live in our town, who's already been to two other dentists, is going to come back here and get the treatment done, the extraction. And we see this all the time. It's the, the ability to say something with a confirmation in your voice that says, I'm very sure of what I'm telling you. And I won't make a mistake by doing something that doesn't need to be done or wouldn't work in the long run. So now that I've done that and, and given you that little pep talk, I'd like you at home <clears throat> to look at the first molar and you're going to see a lesion. This is two-dimensional. But I want you to imagine what else you're seeing here. You're seeing the buccal cortical plate, the lingual cortical plate. The entire 10 to 12 millimeters massive bone has been squeezed into a single image. The tooth and all of its structure squeezed into that same image. So what you're seeing is something of a dark shadow, poorly defined, and how many of us have held an x-ray up to, the, to a, a viewer or pulled a digital image of an x-ray up and tried to explain to a patient what that shadowy area means? Most of you are going to see that that area is associated with the mesial buccal root. And understandably, some of you are going to look at it and say, well, wait a minute, is there some furcation bone loss there? Some will look at it and say, well, what's going on on the distal? And I'll show this x-ray in, in seminars that we do. Nobody sees the entire lesion. Trying to explain this to a patient, what they have and what the options for treatment would be, are very difficult. If I have a periapical lesion, I will start thinking in terms of endodontics. If I have a mid-root lesion, I will start thinking in terms of probably a fractured root and extraction. So when I look at a cone beam image of the same tooth, I see the lesion at the apex of the mesial root, but it also extends in the interceptal area and then along the distal root, mid-root. So in my view, this tooth has a very strong chance of having a distal root fracture. The nerve has probably been dead for a while, and the mesial, the mesial root is abscessing and we're gaining bone loss as the infection grows. So now it's a clear picture. You can see it, I can see it, and the patient can see it. That makes for a better conversation. Let's do another one. Here we have a pretreatment Panorex for a consult. A patient comes in to me and she brings the Panorex in with her from her other dentist's office. And she says, doctor, something in the lower right hurts. Now, basically, I've got two choices here, maybe three. The endodontic fill on the first bicuspid is possibly an issue. The crown on the second molar, possibly an issue. And the third molar laying on its side, <clears throat> fully impacted, is possibly an issue. And so I look at this and I go, I know what my options are, one of three teeth. And I start talking to the patient. She's 69 years old. She's had that impacted wisdom tooth for many years. Um, I would ask you at home, can you tell me, is that wisdom tooth to the buccal or to the lingual of that second molar? And, and the fact is, you can't tell me. So we take the comb beam. We find out in the sagittal view on the lower left that the 
wisdom tooth looks like it's eroding the root of the second molar, but probably has been for some time. Why she's suddenly having symptoms, I'm not sure. In the axial view, in the center of the, of the screen, you can see the distal root has actually lost tooth structure down to where the root, the nerve is almost exposed. In fact, it looks like it is exposed. And finally, on the coronal view on the lower right, we again see the loss of tooth structure, and we also see the inferior alveolar canal. So we mark the canal, we look at the position of the third molar relative to the canal, relative to the second molar, and we come up with a treatment plan. Endodontics is probably not going to work on that second molar. So we're going to extract the second molar. Once you expose the third molar to the oral cavity, I've seen, I've been a dentist now for 39 years, and I've seen too many cases where you get deterioration of that third molar at, uh, within a reasonable period of time. And so we discuss the option of removing the third molar as well. Now this is a great time to assess your own comfort level and say, I'm going to refer you to an oral surgeon or I feel very comfortable doing this and I'm going to do this myself. But if you didn't have the cone beam, if we go back to the Panorex view, that may be a more difficult decision to make if you got the treatment plan correct in the first place. Here's another wisdom tooth scenario. This is an 18 year old coming in for consult for removal of wisdom teeth. Now this patient I look at number 17, and in the sagittal view, lower left picture, I say, okay, that the roots of that tooth are behind or in front of the inferior canal. In the coronal view in the lower right, I can see that the roots are facial to the inferior canal, but intimately associated with it, not in the middle of the canal, but touching the side of it. This is a great time to have a conversation with the patient and talk about paresthesia, the potential for it, the possible consequences, and to get an informed consent if you decide you want to do this extraction. Another thing to keep in mind is this is an extraction that you'll probably want to section the tooth into sections and remove it as gently as possible as opposed to trying to simply elevate it with an elevator. We go to the distal root, we take a look at it. Lower left picture is in the axial view. Both mesial and distal roots very closely associated with the inferior alveolar canal. If you look at the coronal view in the lower right, you'll see that the canal space is actually approaching the uh, margin of the lingual cortical plate. So it's hollowing out the plate. And I've seen cases where the inferior alveolar canal actually is completely outside of the lingual cortical plate. So it's a good thing to have this kind of, a, of an opportunity to view the case before you do it. Number 32, we go to the other side. Here we are again, dangerously close to the infraavular canal. Uh, this patient, these teeth don't look that hard to take out from the standpoint of they're, they're erupted in a vertical position, but they are very delicate and this is going to be a surgery that we're we're really going to want to do a lot of uh, discussion and preparation with the patient and the parents about what paresthesia might mean. Um, we were very fortunate in this case that we were able to get the teeth out and there was no paresthesia and, and everybody's relieved at that point. But I would not begin to approach cases like this without a cone beam today. So <clears throat> what are the limitations of two-dimensional dentistry? Well, you get image distortion especially a panorex, distorts considerably as you go around the curve in the cuspid area. An average panorex is 35% distorted, more so in the cuspid area. You can get superimposition of structures. I can take it, put an implant in, in a very good position, and if I move my PA, mesial or distal, I can make it look like that implant is actually touching or, or impinging on a tooth. If I take a cone beam, that implant could be in, the, in a really good position, a full millimeter to two millimeters away from the tooth. 
So superimposition of structures is, is a real problem. Then differential magnification of the image based on geometry. I can get foreshortening. I can, I can get an impact that looks like I'm four millimeters below the crest of the bone when in fact I'm right at the crest. I can do an endodontic procedure and get a finished film that shows uh, a conglomeration of lines in the sinus area around the first molar to where I really don't know what, how to identify uh, structures in the sinus. So I can't see the morphology of the nasopalatine canal most of the time. I, maxillary sinus septa is difficult. The size and shape of the sinus is very difficult. So let's run you by a couple of exercises here. As most of you diagnose from two-dimensional radiographs, you look at this picture on the left and you say, well, let's see. It could be bone loss. There could be some bone loss just mesial to that cuspid or bicuspid, and perhaps that's affecting the case. Or perhaps the cantilever has an effect on the case. But there's nothing to indicate a significant issue in that picture. If we take a cone beam of the same, same scenario, what we can see now is a fracture line, clearly evident, as we look at a cross-sectional view. That fracture is diagnostically, without question, that tooth is coming out. There's no hesitation. So I know what I'm doing with the picture on the right. I don't know what I'm doing in the picture on the left. And this, would, this is what accounts for an awful lot of missed diagnoses. Here we have a lower second molar with a large periapical lesion. We also have a large bulbous root on a third molar. Um, a lot of times the patient will come in, they'll be, they're going to, you're going to be extracting the second molar, and then you say, well, the third molar is there, we might as well take it as well. So you look at this and go, well, that's kind of a large root, but I can probably make that thing come easily. However, this patient was referred to an endodontist for endodontic therapy, and again, just by chance, wound up in my office and said, uh, what do you think? I want an opinion. So we took a cone beam. Oh, and <laughs> there's that bulbous root. If you tried elevating that third molar, uh, Lingually, you might have a problem with fracture of the lingual cortical plate based on the shape of that tooth. But now back to the, back to the second molar, is endodontics a reasonable uh, treatment for that tooth? Well, we went to the axial view and we found a fracture line in the tooth. And that fracture line extended mesial to distal. As we follow the fracture line down, we went to a coronal view and we could see the fracture line extending some three millimeters or more below the crest of the bone. Even if you could do an endodontic procedure on this tooth, you could not restore the tooth. So the treatment plan, one of the options is not endodontics. You must extract this tooth. And when you go to a patient and you say, Mrs. Smith, there's no question that tooth has to come out. You can't, you're not a candidate for endodontics. That is reassuring to the patient. If you say, well, maybe endodontics, because I can't see everything on my two-dimensional film, that's not reassuring. And that's what a patient, they feel lost, and they feel like they're uncertain of where to go. One of the first patients I had when I moved here to my new practice came in, he was price shopping, and he had a failed six-unit bridge. He came to me and he said, John, what I'd like to do is I know you're a new dentist, you're looking for business, and so I want you to beat the price of the guy that gave me a quote to redo my bridge. And I just love people like this. <laughs> so I said, well, let's do this. I know the cost of a bridge. And I know that I'm probably in the same ballpark as the guy that you probably that you went to. Um, but let's take a look and make sure that everything is ready to do a new bridge. And so we took a cone beam. And he said, well, John, I, can't, I don't want to pay for a cone beam. And I said, OK, well, let's do this. Let's take the cone beam for free. I won't charge you for it. I just want to see some information. Now, the cost of a six-unit bridge 
around the country is typically in the neighborhood of $6,000, about $1,000 a crown. So he came in to me, not wanting to spend $6,000, hoping I would get down to 5,000 or some number under six. And if I did, then he was going to agree to do treatment. This was his whole motivation. We took a cone beam, that lone cuspid that had the buildup and has been endodontically treated has a problem. And I showed him the problem. I said, unfortunately, when the root canal was done, a mistake was made, and that mistake has propagated now, and you're in danger of losing that tooth. And I don't think I would feel comfortable putting that as a terminal abutment of a six-unit bridge. He not only understood, when we extracted the tooth and saw a fracture, he, he was very impressed that we had found it, and he wound up doing some implant-supported a uh, three-unit bridge and a single implant-supported crown and some other crowns, and that $6,000 case that he so badly wanted to price shop turned into something in, around the neighborhood of $17,000 to $18,000. But he did it because he understood the value of the treatment, and he was impressed with the fact that we didn't miss that little detail that would have wasted the $6,000 had he spent it the first time. So people talk price, but they don't really mean it. They want value. I would say a majority of people want value. So the question is, are cone beams necessary? I think that cone beam technology is the most complete and accurate source of information necessary to make an accurate diagnosis. Here we have a patient who walks in and she's got a crown off. She wants me to cement the crown back on. So I ask her a few questions. We have to make a decision. Is that crown worth putting back on the tooth? Well, first of all, it came off because the tooth is very short and very overly tapered. So there's no mechanical retention. Is it worth $1,000 to make a new crown? And you look, and I've had people say, <clears throat> well, there's probably a fracture on the distal root or there's a periodontal lesion on the distal root, or there's a lesion on the mesial root. The fact that I can't get a room full of dentists to agree on what they see in this case tells me that they can't get a patient to understand what it is that they're seeing. And then are you going to make a strong recommendation based on what you think you see? Or if you can visualize that mesial root, a pathology, the distal root is not fractured, but there's definitely some uh, bone loss in that area. Now you can tell a patient that yes, I can remake a crown for $1,000, but I feel the tooth is in danger. <coughs> I can possibly redo a, an endodontic procedure, or I can probably take the tooth out and place an implant. And the greatest chance of success, in my view, in this case, would have been to take the tooth out and place an implant. Even though that was the most costly procedure, that's what the patient elected to do once we had the cone beam image. Now, what exactly is it you're seeing here? If you look at the picture on the left, again, you're seeing all of the buccal bone all of that thick lingual cortical plate and all of the mass in between. So I'm looking at the picture on the right and I'm, in, I'm envisioning that entire mass and then I look at the left and go, wait a minute, how come that lesion disappears? It's because the bone lingual to that lesion is masking it. What am I looking at on a cone beam? I'm looking at a line drawn through the tooth, through the bone and through the lesion. That allows me to visualize the lesion very clearly, and that's what allows the patient to visualize that lesion. So knowing the location and size of a canal before I do an endo uh, procedure, if you look at this tooth, we can visualize the, from an apical view the location and size of the canal. If you look carefully, you can see a slight little accessory canal just mesial as you get to the apex and if you look at the finished film on the right you'll see a little bit of material 
going out that same accessory canal as we were very fortunate to get a good fill on that. But visualizing again to do an endo and to do it well, if you can see the canals, you know what your, your goal is and success. Finally, what, when is a lesion significant to a patient? Because most of these lesions don't hurt. So here's a case where I took a patient and I said, Mrs. Smith, you've got a lesion. And she said, well, I don't feel it. I said, it's 4.12 millimeters tall. It's, it's three, mil, three and a half millimeters wide. It's, it's four millimeters deep. And I showed it to her and she said, I don't want to do anything about it. And I said, okay, no problem. At least you know it's there. That's really my job is to tell you everything that you have. Five years later, the patient comes back a new comb beam was taken. Now I have a new machine, so the image is a little bit different appearance, but we go back and we measure again. Now we measure larger numbers, seven by five by almost six. And I show her the old image and I show her the new image. And I say what that means is the bone mass is decreasing around the root of that tooth. And it's taken five years, it's a slow growing chronic lesion, but in five years, you've lost bone, and in five more years, you will probably lose more bone. Now she decides to have the area fixed because we could actually measure this. Not, I was never able to do this. I didn't even think about doing this prior to having a comb beam. <clears throat> this case we'll go through quickly is a denture case that came to me early when I first got a comb beam. The patient was having trouble. And I took a look at her lower implants, went to an axial view, and I started walking down the length of the implants. And as I went apical, the implants began to exit the bone. The further apical I went, the more they exited the bone. So these implants are laying on their side. Um, here I have a 30-year-old female. She lives quite a distance from me, uh, 1,200 miles to be exact. And she went to her dentist who took a PA, tried to explain the nature of the problem. She didn't understand it. She actually flew out to see me, which I think is, is not necessary. But to get the comb beam, understand the treatment, do the measurements, try to determine, we, we try to salvage this tooth. It would have a crown to root ratio of over four to one. Or do we talk about replacing it with an implant? And if we do, then we're going to have to do some grafting. So this case turned out very well, even though it was one of those uncomfortable un situations where someone has traveled a long distance and you have to do as much in one appointment as you possibly can. So we did an emplacement, a graft, um, rebuilt the site. She came back to do the restoration. This is the impression phase. And you can see we got some really good tissue for the final restoration. Large lesion. Uh, you can see something on the lower left picture. You can't see anything on the lower right. We go to the cone beam image. There's a lesion that's one of the largest I've ever seen. It's 20 millimeters uh, mesiodistally, 15 millimeters apical coronal, and buccolingually, 12 millimeters. It completely housed the infraorbillar nerve. So the axial and coronal views show we still have a slight shell, but only a shell of bone, both buccal and lingual. We extracted the teeth. Here again, when we sent this case in for biopsy, we were able to place platelet-rich fibrin only. And what we found is four months later, the patient came back. I was curious. I wanted to see what the healing was like. I can't see below the tissue, so we took a cone beam, and what you'll find is you'll find that we have osteoid material growing, and we've reformed the infraorbillar canal, forming borders. We've maintained width and height of bone. It was just an amazing case of healing. I'd like to finish with a concept that's fairly new nowadays uh, called airway management. If you take a cone beam with the right field of view, you can see the airway. Now my new unit, the Excelsior, has the capability of giving me an airway with every patient that I take. So this is what we call a normal airway. You look at the space, the 
pharyngeal space, and you, you can actually measure this in different planes and create a volume so you can determine that this patient's got a very healthy breathing pattern and probably no sleep apnea here. Then you have patients who come in like this. This is a 59-year-old male, overweight, has some issues. This does not mean you have to treat the patient, but you look at him and you might want to ask him a question. Do you have trouble sleeping? Do you snore at night? Do you have narcolepsy? These are medical issues that you might want to address in your practice. And if you look at these airways, it can help you to get these people to the right area for treatment if they're interested, or you can develop a, a niche of practice in your practice of treating sleep apnea and doing airway management. <clears throat> so you must have, again, the information in order to do the proper diagnosis and proper treatment plan. If you look at this case, this is not a sleep apnea case. This is a patient who had, oral, uh, who had throat cancer treated several years ago, and she's had some surgeries. She now comes in and she's, she tells me that she wants a sleep apnea test done because she's having trouble breathing. And I took the cone beam. And I said, what I'd really like you to do is go back and see your physician because this tissue mass needs to be removed before we can truly evaluate whether sleep apnea is a problem. Now keep in mind, this is only one plane. So as, I, as we move from uh, sagittally from uh, right to left, we will get areas where she can breathe, but there's a lot of mass obstructing her, but it, this is not a good sleep apnea case. Having the information allows me to get her to the right doctor. So again, let's close with this. What can you diagnose from this film? I'm going to guess most of you are going to tell me that that endodontic, endodontically treated by cuspid <clears throat> is probably pretty well filled, but has a lesion to the mesial about a third to half the way up the root. That's what everybody sees on this two-dimensional film. Whereas the Cone beam image shows a lesion to the distal of the apex of the root, and in fact expanding the bone to the facial. Misdiagnosis can be one of two natures, overdiagnosis or underdiagnosis. And we're all guilty of both. But the more information you have with the cone beam, the less you're going to miss it. 3D imaging can reduce complications, prevent mistakes in diagnosis and treatment planning. It can be used in restorative dentistry, orthodontics, extractions, surgery, endodontics, implant dentistry, identifying pathology, and evaluating any type of anatomic anomalies. It's a very useful tool in every scenario. So the question early on was, what's the cost of a combi machine? Well, it's a it's considerable, but if you get all of this information, you will treat and plan better, you will do more dentistry, and therefore you will be able to grow your practice and it financially it pays off. So the cost is not the consideration, it's the value. And that concludes my presentation. Wow, Dr. Julian, thank you so much for that. That, that was an exceptionally detailed um, way of seeing lots of cool stuff in there. And I was really appreciating how um, clear all those images were. That's routine in your practice with the Prexian device. Yes, yes it is. Okay, do you, um, when you have a patient coming in, because you know, our audience is gonna be from Dental Sleep Practice Magazine, although there's likely gonna be people here from the, uh, uh, from Orthodontic Practice US and Endo Practice US, actually all four magazines from MedMark are, are going to be uh, well served by this presentation. I like that. But for the airway patients, on all of your images, do you uh, have a conversation with your uh, patients about what you see in the airway, or is it do you focus mostly, mostly on that that tooth with the lesion, or the or the, some of the other examples like you show? I don't have a large um, airway management practice. And therefore, I don't have that conversation with everybody. I have it with people when I see a restricted airway, I will ask a few screening type of questions. Okay. On the other hand, I have patients come to me and ask me about sleep apnea. 
And the first thing I do is we take a cone beam and we assess the airway. Right. I'm not someone who is an expert in airway management, but I've treated sleep apnea enough and TMJ problems enough that I can say, yes, this is a case I can help you with, or this is a case we need to refer and get you to somebody who can do it. So just having the information to know when to treat, or what, it's just like a wisdom tooth. Do I want to take this out or get it referred? I know the information from the cone beam that can get me. Well, that, and, and having that will give you that confidence that you were talking about. So when you sit with a patient and say, well, I have some ideas for you, they'll feel that well in that information that you have, yes. I believe, in your interactions, yeah. You didn't mention about TMJ. I know we only had a few minutes to talk about all this stuff, but yes. uh, and there's a lot to talk about, I understand. But could you say just a moment about um, your uh, how you integrate TM, the condylar you know, complex assessment into some of that? Well, let me, let me begin by saying I used to be a TMJ expert, <laughs> but I am today a closet TMJ expert. I, yeah. I found a lot of patients who stressed me and were really in demand of a lot of attention, uh, whether we gained ground or not. The more I treated, the more I became a little bit less likely to promote that kind of therapy. However, I can recognize TMJ. This machine takes beautiful TMJ pictures, and when I feel the need, I go into doing TMJ uh, mode. I didn't show any pictures. I just ran out of time with the presentation. Right. Yeah. Uh, so can it do it? Yes. You, you can take sets with this machine for orthodontics. You can take TMJ films. So yeah. the usefulness of the machine is incredible. Wow, that's, that, that is fantastic. And like I, as I was thinking about while you were presenting, uh, my mind was going to all four magazines, because anybody interested in orthodontics, anybody interested in implants, anybody interested in, in uh, airway issues, and anybody in, interested in endodontics uh, are all going to benefit, just like you showed, clear example after example of the uh, kind of data we can get. So that was pretty fantastic. Well, and I think the idea is you don't want to say this is an implant machine. It's not. This is a machine for dentistry, all right. dentistry. And it's not limited in any field of dentistry. You know, th the, the concept of seeing a cavity from the axial view. You know, I'm, I'm not a restorative dentist anymore, but wow, that, that, that looked pretty, pretty amazing there. That, what a clear picture. Um, I, I have to say, uh, and sadly, thank you everyone for your questions. We, we have run out of time today. So if we didn't get to the question that you posted, we will answer it by email. So uh, again, thank you for being here. Thank you again for attending this webinar and a special thank you to Dr. Julian and our sponsor for this webinar, Prexion. Thank you and everyone have a great day. Thank you.